Thank you so much for all the questions before. Thank you for your attention so far. This is the last session. Um, hopefully you're super, suitably caffeinated to, to go through this bit till the end. Um, uh, what we're going to do is we've slightly just restructured the next bit, um, which is why if you saw me frantically typing on my laptop outside, that's what we were doing. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to try and run through the next uh, bits of feedback a bit quicker, um, sorry, bits of um, high-level um, points of the, the booking spec a bit quicker. And what that all enables to do is spend a bit more time on the Q&A at the end. Um, so I think actually there's more questions than we thought would come through, and it'd be really great to make sure that we can get to as many of those as possible, make sure people are, um, have got the answers they need and can surface further issues if, if needed. Um, so I'm going to do that fire hose thing of giving you lots of information again, um, if you're ready. Uh, and uh, it starts with our favorite topic from before, <laughs> guest checkout. Um, so are you ready for this? going to be great. I'm going to start with, um, with Fusion's experience, so guest checkout. Um, although it's quite whited out on that screen for some reason. Um, what you can hopefully see on there is that there's a first name, surname, email address is what they capture as a guest. Um, to flick to GLL's version of the same, uh, if you're booking as a guest uh, on a ticket, you actually get just email address uh, as a guest. And, um, and this is what the guest checkout experience, it's not just in this sector. I mean, these are the you know, two massive operators in our sector doing this. Um, this is not just our sector that does this. If you book anything online, um, you don't really expect to give them more information than they need often with these kind of bookings, right? You just give them an email address. In fact, if you're paying with Google Pay or Apple Pay, the only information, which is your thumbprint, the only information you actually have to use total is telephone number, full name, surname, and email address, those four fields. So you don't get more than that if you're paying with Google Pay, unless you ask for something else and, and, make, and, and add more steps to that experience. So um, that's back to the question of what, what is the required field? I think we covered this in the first section, but the required field here is email address. The others are optional. Um, and that, what that means is that we can do what GLL's done here and create that great experience. Um, if we want to, but if we want to capture more details, and again, that's a conversation between broker and seller, you can capture more information. Um, what this does mean is that in terms of booking systems, it might be a little bit more difficult, depending on how the booking system has been structured, um, to, to do the guest checkout. Because if you're used to creating members in a booking system, it might be a bit more difficult if you can't create a member using date of birth, for example, and all those additional bits of data that you would need to do that. Um, but actually, from the conversations we've had about this, it, it sounds like that's actually what is in the user's best interests and not creating members when they're not members, because obviously these aren't signing up for membership. They're just signing up as a guest checkout user. They might, they might not come back. They might come back. Um, is, is more in keeping with what is expected from the experience. And so um, that's, that's where, th where this is, uh, guest checkout. Um, the slightly controversial point, which is next, is this. GDPR, ah. um, and that's because uh, actually looking at both of these experiences, guest checkout in GLL and guest check checkout in Fusion, they're not asking for marketing preferences. The current experience as of today, they're not asking for marketing preferences. Actually, if you look at a lot of guest checkout experiences, that's the same, which is interesting. And now we did have a lengthy debate about could we ask for marketing preferences, because obviously everybody wants to market to those people that come through. Um, to summarize that debate and to give you an illustration of what the complexity looks like, let's say that someone went through Change for Life to book something in Fusion and ticked the box to say, I want marketing. Now, that same email address comes through Badminton England to book a Badminton court and doesn't tick the box. And what do we do? The same person has said two different things with the exact same question. The first time they were asked, are you happy for Fusion Lifestyle to send you marketing material or whatever? Second time they were asked, are you happy for Fusion Lifestyle to send you marketing material? Same question, two different websites. So do you check the box and uncheck the box? Uh, and, then, and then, but then that's not, okay, that's, that's a problem. But then what if someone wants to unsubscribe? So if someone goes into Fusion and uh, goes into Change for Life and says, I don't want to be associated with you anymore, and then they, 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 they untick all the marketing preferences uh, and they delete their account, does that then delete the details? And, and, or does it delete? It doesn't delete the details insofar as, from a, a, a GDPR point of view, you're allowed to keep, as related to the service, 
the basic de details and data, but you're sure as heck aren't allowed to market to them in that case. So there's a, there's a real like, problem about this, which isn't so it's not, it's not impossible to solve, um, but at the end of the workshop where we debated this, um, I think the, the conclusion from the room, this is one of the, the legend workshops actually the, um, uh, with legend customers, um, the, the, um, the, the room kind of said, well, why are we even, what's the point of this anyway? Like, um, surely we're trying to get more people through the door and, and just and when they're in, we can market the product to them because they're, they're seeing what we've got. We don't need to send them 100 emails. That's not the point of this. The point of this is to get more people, lead generation, to get more people into our sites. Um, and so the conclusion that was reached um, there and that we've re replaying it through various other people in different conversations and different calls has been repeated is that actually this is a good thing to do maybe in the future, but for right now in keeping the scope simple and the complexity of this simple, um, it's something that maybe we should keep out of scope for the moment. And so marketing preferences is not in scope of the booking standard at the moment for those reasons. Um, but again, please, if you feel strongly that it should be, and let's have a conversation about it, Slido, um, and upvote it. Um, very happy to, yeah, but, like we definitely can go through that. Um, I think, yeah, it's just an interesting, interesting problem. Um, so yes, so there we go, that's marketing preferences. Straightforward. Um, access control. Another relatively straightforward one. Um, so the access control, um, I guess what we mean when we say access control here, we say, we're saying, what, what is it that you need to have on you to turn up at a site? If you're, um, if you're going to a, a squash court, if you're going to a tennis court that's maybe in a park, maybe there's a, there's a pin code on the door of that, ten on, on the, the gate of that tennis court. If it's a leisure centre, maybe there's a barcode you need to get into that leisure centre. Um, if you're just turning up to a, um, a community hall, maybe you don't need anything at all. Or maybe it's just a, a simple email address or something that you can use as a token. Something that basically says this is the, t the payment has been taken. Um, currently, the, th the three things... Thanks, Ben. Um, sorry. <laughs> the three things that um, this supports right now are... Um, Barcodes, so you can barcode QR codes. That's all. That's all possible. Uh, simple, an image of some sort. I mean, I don't. You could put a barcode in the image or an image of a cat or whatever it is. Um, something that says yes, this is this has been paid for. Um, and also text, so codes like a PIN number or email address. They're the three things that are currently supported. Um, and the idea is that if the barcode is used, for example, that you can walk into a site. And I mean, the ideal use case is that you pay with your thumb, so you don't even give me, a, you know, do anything. It gives you a barcode, and you scan it into the center if there's a scanner, and then that's it. Um, that's the, the future. So what you can do with trains right now, you know, on the train line app, you can do that with your thumb. You can walk through the gate, and you can do that on your way to the to the train without even going to the, the ticket desk. So other other obviously other sectors are are doing this, um, and that's that's the experience that's possible here. Wouldn't that be cool? So that's access control. Uh, cancellation. Um, so how does cancellation work? This is actually a slightly more difficult than it sounds problem um, because uh, there's two types of cancellation. There's the seller has a, there's a flood in the center and they have to just you know or the, or the things rained off and they have to cancel everything, um, which means that it could be you know 50, 100 people that need to be notified that there's a cancellation and told to not not attend. Um, and there's also the, the, the customer could say, actually, no, I'm not interested anymore. I want to, I want to cancel. So those two are taken into account. Um, so the two things that we do are provider requested cancellation and customer requested cancellation. Those things we cover uh, in the spec at the moment. And what that means is, and how, how, how that works to, to um, make that real is, um, provider requested cancellation, um, if you're in a booking system, depending on how the booking system supports this, and you just say cancel, cancel the event, then the broker receives that notification. That's currently how it's set up. The broker receives a notification saying this has been cancelled. And then we, we mentioned before that it's on the broker to do that communication. So the broker can then pass that on and say to the, you know, through the, through the app notification or whatever they've got as their medium um, to the customer to say it's been cancelled. And obviously, if the broker is also maintaining a calendar or something, they can take it out of the calendar um, and update all of the relevant information wherever that's being displayed. Um, so that's provider requested. And then the customer requested is the other way around. Um, but it works 
with the same mechanism. So the customer requested is basically saying to the provider, can I cancel this? And if the provider says yes, it initiates the same type of cancellation request. Um, and the way it works behind the scenes is that it's, it, the booking system is the um, authority on cancellation. If the booking system says a thing has been cancelled, then that is done. That's the way it's currently set up. It doesn't matter what the broker wants to say about anything as far as booking system is concerned and legally as, part, as far as the agent broker is concerned. Um, it's cancelled and a refund is due. So if a thing's been cancelled, um, then what that does in the spec is it automatically says that's, that's triggered a refund. That affects the order in such such a way as to say that and then um, the uh, the, the payment provider and the broker can can work out how to process that refund and deliver it. And obviously, the broker can, if they want to, for example, I, I know certain uh, organizations here will do this, they might not give them the refund immediately. They might call up the customer and want to keep their business. So they might say, hey, your thing's been canceled. Your pitch was rained off. We can give you a refund on this, but do you want to try and can I book you in somewhere else? And obviously, some brokers will want to do that because they want to keep that business. And great for you as sellers because... Well, that's, that's another reason that the, the person's going to carry on booking, right? Um, and so, um, so that's, that's something that they can do. But as I said, um, ultimately, if the customer says, no, I quite like my refund, please, then that's the, uh, it's, it's the, the broker's got to then deliver that refund. That's how that's set up. Um, and, and what that means is what, what's not included in here um, is cancellation fees and partial refunds. Because the other way you could do it is, is you could say, oh, well, actually, yeah, but you don't get all the money back as a broker or as a, as a, a booking system or as the seller, and those things aren't in scope. So we've tried to keep it as simple as possible. So you can do a whole refund or not at all. Um, you might not do it at all if it's too close to the event and if the customer's asking. Um, and you also can't do a refund as part of this after the opportunities occurred. So if someone turns up to an event and says, oh, it was rubbish because, you know, whatever, the, the teacher didn't turn up, um, the spec doesn't currently include a way of, of doing a refund on that basis. Um, but I mean, the reason we've done that is just to keep it simple. So trying to like account for the two most important things, you know, pitches rained off and customer wants to cancel, but not getting too bogged down in the details of how we would do partial refunds and all this kind of thing. If you think this is really important for some reason, that's please put it in Slido. Please upvote that. Um, let's have the conversation. I mean, this is literally a scoping thing. We could we could definitely include those three points at some point in the future. Um, it's just a case of if right now that's needed to move forward with all of this. Super. These are the most exciting topics. I've left them right to last. Sorry about that. Um, booking approval. This is particularly important in uh, schools. Um, so school uh, letting situations, I'm going to try and explain it. Sorry if I don't get it quite right, Sammy. Um, you uh, have a situation where you uh, have to get the caretaker lined up or whatever it is that you need in place so that you can... Um, you can allow that person to book a badminton court. You can't just say, come book a badminton court on a Saturday. There's a few extra steps that need to take place uh, in order to assure that they can go ahead and book. This is actually exactly the same as in tri-tag rugby, uh, tri rugby and in other places where you want to get a, a ringer into your league. You want to check that you're happy with that person. So you want to say, um, you know, is that... So you want, you want to be able to say, there's a space open on this team who wants to be involved in this, a number of people can then say, yes, I do, I do, I do, and the person who's the captain of the team can say, okay, I pick this person and approve them, and that rejects the others. Um, and that, that's, that's allowed, that's, it's in the spec, mainly because schools require it as part of the, and that's obviously, we want to make sure that schools are included in this and that spaces in schools can be um, uh, used by brokers. Um, and it's just, it's just a very same thing as we went through earlier. It's just there's a tiny little change at the bottom where there's an approval step before the payment's captured. So you take that payment from the card, you authorize it. This is how hotels work as well. You say you've got that five pounds. Um, and then at the point where it gets approved, then that five pounds is, is captured. So you know, therefore, that if you've got a number of people ready to join the team or if it, if it, if it costs money or um, who, are, who are willing to um, book that badminton court in that school, then you know that they've all paid and you can definitely say yes to one and guarantee payment and move forward on that basis and cancel the others because you've got the payment authorised. Um, also means that there's not much extra work to implement this off the back of the normal spec, so it's a very small change. Um, small but important change because of who it includes. Um, so there's that. There's also dynamic pricing uh, to uh, the chap at the back who asked if it was in here. Yes, it is. Um, uh, dynamic pricing, again, is included. Um, and what this means is that the broker,
can set the price. But obviously this is only going to happen in situations where the seller has allowed them to do that as part of their conversations, as part of their, um, what, 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 how, whatever they've, they've got in place with the contract or with that discussion as a partner. Um, and this is quite important because it allows for a range of scenarios where prices might not always be what's in the booking system. There might be situations where you want to provide last minute pricing, um, you know, like EasyJet does, or you might want to um, do a, a deal in a certain way. Um, and what this, this allows you to do is, is it allows all of those commercial opportunities um, without, uh, yeah, that's, that's, what it, that's what it allows. Um, so the difference between that broker set pricing and fully dynamic pricing is that fully dynamic pricing means um, that you can, um, you don't even need to set the price when you're booking it, you can set the price later. And that's what um, is it Chris was, was talking about. So that's, that's uh, and the reason that's in there is to allow for a certain type of business model which is in use by folks like MoveGB. Um, and the way that works is that the price of the session is calculated at the end of the month. And that's how their, their commercials are set up. And so if you book a certain number of squash courts, you know, you, you, it's a bit like, you know, when you, if you use the Oyster card on the tube, if you're a London based, you hit a daily cap. So things like that can be implemented where the, the price changes depending on how many have been booked or, or, um, or pricing based on um, volume. Those types of things. So if you're doing volume-based pricing over a certain time period, dynamic pricing allows you to do that. So like I said before, the objective of this spec is to allow for all possible business models and things like that to work. Um, and what business models you choose to adopt will be a conversation between the seller um, and, the, uh, and the broker. What it doesn't do, we talked about earlier, is subscription-based, which is where you get a, like a card to walk into the center. And that's... Um, that's a slightly different scenario. That just that's a whole other problem because that basically means that if you've got like a like a card, like a, um, a membership card that you get given, that you can walk into a fusion site and use it, or walk into a GLL site and use it, or walk into another place and use it. And um, that's a really good scenario. And I know that there are local authorities and others who want that across their different sites. Um, it's not currently in the spec in the scope, um, but again. Let's talk about that if that's something that is of interest or, or needed, or maybe it's a version 1.1 thing. Um, but mainly because it's a whole different technical thing. It's an, it would be a totally different framework to do that because the conversation, it, the, the data is going the other way. So it's the booking system telling the broker what's been booked, right? Because they've, they've walked in ad hoc and used their swipe card, not the other way around. Um, so that's what's not included. Um, cool. There we go. That was quick, wasn't it? That was, that was all the things. Um, and so what we covered there is the scope of the specification. Um, and, uh, and that's all the things that are in uh, scope. And we've talked about some of the things that are out of scope and why they've been out of scope. Um, and so the, the question we wanted to, to, to leave with you guys for the, the next session, the next Slido session, and as well as the stuff we've just talked about is really, so we've just talked about a bunch of stuff. Right? Before there was a lot of, a lot of content and now we've talked about some features which are in there. That are, a lot of them are hygiene factors. Some of them are necessary, depending on who you are. Um, is that enough for you guys to crack on, basically? Is that what, um, I, I, I know someone came to me and said there was a discussion at lunch where someone was saying um, that wouldn't, what they wanted to see before they could do anything else was uh, clear guidance around how this works with data protection. And that was a blocker for them. Uh, someone here. Uh, it was a block for them because they, they, want, they want the data protection uh, information to be uh, uh, clear how that, how that works with this and then we thought about everything and is that all secure. Um, so something like that is really important for us to know because if that's going to block you guys from um, moving forward then it'd be great to get that, um, that in uh, here. So, um, so yeah, so the, the, next, the next question to ask you guys is really from the stuff we've just talked about and I'll put back up on the screen the, the big list of scopes so you can use that as a prompt if you need. Is there anything that we've got in here um, of all the things we've talked about, of all the, maybe flash through all the madness that we've gone through, um, and there's a lot, of, a lot of content, of course, but this is really it. You know, this is the basics. Um, all the stuff on the left we've talked about, and that's, that's it. Oh, except, sorry, child booking. Child booking is possible. That's it. Um, that is literally it. And the reason that's it is because we're not capturing date of birth and email address is the only thing we need to capture for checkout. As soon as you capture date of birth and don't do guest checkout, 
then child booking becomes a world of pain because you need to worry about are you capturing kids' details? Are you like how does that how are you identifying a child? If they're five years old, they haven't got an email address, they're not uniquely identifiable. Uh, full name, surname, e and date of birth could be used, but then um, what if they're twins with the same name? Um, all that stuff um, is difficult. So basically, if we use guest checkout, child booking works seamlessly. Um, all that other stuff we've talked about. Um, and then there's stuff on the right, some of which we haven't mentioned specifically, but it's, it's not in scope at the moment. So, yeah, I guess there's, there's, that's, the, that's the, the, the question, really. Um, so is there anything in there that you'd like to see, or is there anything additional in terms of guidance that you want? Um, please do have a chat in your groups, and then put it in Slido and upvote, and we'll have a great chat afterwards. Thank you. All right, it's time for the Q&A section. It's the best bit. Um, so thank you everybody for voting and thank you for those online still engaged we've been watching your conversations very animated so um, so great guys uh, thank you for that and um, please do um, continue as we talk if something comes up vote uh, plus one like something if you see it on the screen somewhere and you want to talk about that we are being led by your thumbs ups um, so please do thumbs up things um, and uh, OK, so my, the questions I've got on my phone are in a slightly different order to the ones on the screen. So I'm not ignoring your questions. I'm just going on a different running order. Um, so the first question I have here is from Richard Brown. Is there a user-friendly summary about what's in or out of scope from the Open Active Standards? It would help for consistent discussions back with colleagues. Can I ask a clarification question? Is that what data is made open, or is that about booking? It was just a, this is really interesting. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it was just that this is really interesting. There's a lot of content there. I think, it, do I trust myself to relay all that back in, in an accurate format to colleagues back at the ranch, really? So if there was something, I know the slides might be made available, but again, I'd still have to condense a lot of slides into a short conversation. Sure. Yeah, we could, we could put some, something together. Yeah, I mean, I think we could, you know, we could put together a couple of blog posts about why certain choices have been made and be really clear on what's in and out of scope to help you do that. I guess um, it's more than just a few bullet points. I'm guessing you want to give a description around it. Just, yeah, just a summary. A couple of pages. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can knock something together. Yeah. Um, Thanks. We can provide this slide deck. Yes, well, you'll have the slide deck, uh, absolutely. Um, okay, so question from Nish. The, the spec defines the minimum, but the seller decides what they want, so things like marketing preferences or not, uh, uh, guest checkout or not. Um, so does the booking system have to implement all options anyway, or do booking systems implement the spec as it is, and then some sellers have to wait for more features down the line, or they just live with it and use it as is? Uh, so to be clear, well, I'm trying to pick about those brackets there. Um, so some things like marketing preferences are just not included in the specification. So the, the, the way this would, would likely work is in terms of um, if you want to comply to the open active specification as it is, that means passing a validator or that kind of thing, then you would technically comply with things like, you know, that, that, that one required email field, you must be able to make a booking with just email in order to comply. So things like that. Um, marketing preferences being in there aren't, I mean, we're not, it's not, it's not in there at all, if you see what I mean. So it's not, we're not checking for compliance with it because it's not, it's not there. And so um, I guess the question, if, if, um, if there's something you want to do which is not in the booking scope, you're very welcome to do that. You probably would do it out of band. I, what I mean by out of band is separate to the spec, maybe even separate to the API. Maybe you would do it manually. If you want to collect marketing preferences, you could easily give a list of emails on a monthly basis you know, for example, or a daily basis, or with a whatever you want way of means of doing that. Um, there's nothing to prevent you from having those separate conversations. And I suppose what we've really tried to do here is make the really difficult thing, which is make a booking with a minimum amount of information possible. And then if you want to do anything on top of that, separately to this, they're absolutely available to do. You can, you can definitely do that. And I guess that the, the that will be really useful for us because it will help drive the next version of the specification. So if what we're finding is that people do the minimum, but then on top of that they start doing X or Y extra thing, um, then that's a really good thing to inform what we do next. Um, so yeah, that would help. So you can you can you can do you can do what the spec says you can do. If you want to do more, you can do that separately. Nish has a follow-on question. 
And Ros has a question as well, off the question. Sorry, just to clarify. Follow up Character limits make it difficult. Um, <clears throat> so is the expectation that the booking systems implement the spec as is? Or like, on our table, for example, we had a few legend users that had different requirements, let's say. So does legend have to talk to all the customers, find what the average minimum is, and implement that? Or is it the spec as is? What, when you say possible? minimum, and um, so the spec, what, what, give me a couple of examples, sorry. So let's say um, a seller wants to, has to include um, first name, last name, some, something in the uh, um, identify step of the, of the booking flow. Yep. Um, and they use uh, legend, let's say. Right. And a different legend user doesn't want to do that. They're happy with the flow as it is. Oh, Does I see. Does legend have to build to the, actually the highest spec of their customers or the lowest spec? Well, with that particular example, the spec includes the fields with optional, 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 mandatory, what, by which the legend would have that information. It's up to the broker what they supply each time. And so uh, you can do what you're asking within the spec at both levels already. You see what I mean? But maybe that's a different example but it would be clearer. But the, the spec is generally designed so it works, so it allows for all the things to happen. Um, and the booking system supporting the spec will be able to take that extra information if it's supplied. Um, maybe a second example, you said there were t two things. No, I think that has helpful. So you're saying that the spec has some mandatory fields and non-mandatory fields, but the, the total amount of fields should cover most of the use cases. The total amount of fields right now, full name, surname, email address, telephone number. That's, that's it. So right now, the spec, you can ask your brokers to capture all of that, or you can ask them to just capture email address. And that's currently what's available. You can't capture date of birth as it stands. Roz, did you want to also ask a question? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think you, you've kind of answered my question there. But I mean, th there's still sort of uh, the questions around date of birth. Hmm. I think th there are definitely going to be some scenarios when you want someone's date of birth. Um, mm -hmm. And by the sound of it, you, you're, you're, you're saying that we, we can still implement that. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess the question is, so we have the open active booking spec here, and we have our slightly different booking spec here. Mm -hmm. um, th that, that sort of, <laughs> you're either duplicating work there, or you're sort of almost forgetting the open active booking spec, because you're saying, right, this is my spec, and I implement the open active spec, but I also implement this, this, and this. So I guess it's... And, sorry. sorry. And, and, and I thought sort of part of the point of this was that everybody would be implementing exactly the same spec right. so that they can easily uh, integrate with that person, that person, and that person. Absolutely. But if I've got to tell my customers that I'm doing something slightly different, does that not go against what... So just the point of this? Uh, to be clear, the, 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 I think the difference is between the, option, the required and the optional, probably. So... Um, uh, the other thing I should say um, is that everything is extendable as well. So if you wanted to allow for additional fields, actually, they're not in the spec, but you could, you could allow for an additional optional field of date of birth. And we would, you, we would give you a recommendation about what to call that field, and you could include that as a custom object. It's got these four fields. You could add an extra field. The, 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 what the spec says is, though, that that shouldn't be a required field, so that if someone has, like you say, because, it's this, because someone is implemented against spec should expect all the things to work the same, um, if their thing expects to just be able to give you email address as a booking system, the booking system should accept just email address. However, if the thing also supports additional fields, do you see what I mean? So, you, so I suppose it's, it's so you, a... You can't enforce the, the, the mandatory, what the mandatory fields are? Not, not at present in the, in the, at the booking system level, no. Only at the uh, um, provider um, uh, broker sorry, the seller broker conversation level. And the reason for that is that there's no way in the spec to advertise these, these, system, these fields must be filled out. You'd have to return an error or something. And then that, we just, it's just, there's nothing in scope that includes that kind of um, negotiation about what I need versus what I can supply. It's just a kind of, this is what I expect. It's just email address and some optional stuff. Does that make sense? I guess when we all, I'm asking a slightly different way is, if, uh, if, you've, if you've built, uh, the booking system such that it can uh, accept an order with just email address, 
Um, and then anything else on there is a bonus and can be discussed by your customers. Um, then that's probably what would be needed to do this. But that shouldn't be any different to your other API. If you've got another API that maybe has mandatory fields in it, then this is just saying it's a slightly less restricted version of that. So you would just relax those constraints. Yeah, I think the point is though we don't want to. I don't think we want to relax those constraints. Oh, lots of thoughts over there. See if so. I might come back to that if anyone's got some thoughts on that in the room around. Um, it strikes me there is provision in the spec to support that. It's not unreasonable for a booking system to require extra fields that, as far as a broker is concerned, are optional in the common case. Um, there is an incomplete customer details error, which the spec mandates a booking system should throw if there are insufficient customer details. It wouldn't be much of a stretch to spec what the missing fields are in that case. Yes, yeah, so the challenge with that is that you'd have to, the user experience would be, oh, uh, you, you would try it and it would fail and you would have to try again, if you see what I mean? So it's not, it's, there's not a negotiation. I, I, take, your, I take your point. Um, there is a way that we could build something in there like that. I guess what I'm saying is it currently isn't, but maybe actually rather than, I feel like we're probably talking at two different levels. There's what does the spec say, but then I guess the question to really ask is why are we capturing that? Because it comes back to our guest checkout point of the guest checkout minimum in the two examples we showed was email address. Is what we're saying that we would like that experience to be email address and some other fields? And I guess, I guess my question is, if so, why? Is that being driven by the user experience? And um, what's the... Good grief. <laughs> lots, of, lots of questions here. This is Could a you, lively discussion. Let's do it. Are we not actually thinking about this completely the wrong way around? So if you've got a child's class, for instance, that requires knowing a date of birth, yeah. then whoever's handling the booking knows that it's a child's class and then presents the appropriate booking schema for the data that's required. Rather than worrying about what's in the spec, it's more a case of knowing that the booking provider, whether an aggregator or a website or whatever, understands the difference between a child's class with an age restriction built into it versus an open aerobics class. That's a really good, okay, so that, to rephrase what I've heard slightly there, um, what we haven't answered is how do you know there's a child's class and how do you book onto a child's versus an adult class? So the way that this currently works is a bit like if you were with the ticketing example from GLL, with GLL, you can book onto a trampolining class for, for under eights or whatever it is, not under eights, uh, a trampoline class for kids. Um, and you can do that by just supplying an email address. And the reason you can do that is because it's advertising it as a kid's class. And you're going through that process saying, great, I know I've read it's a kid's class and I'm going to um, you know, proceed on that basis. And so I guess it's a different, it's a different way around because we're not, we're not double checking the age in order to allow them in. Uh, we're, we're just capturing the bare minimum of detail and, and trusting them to read the description, which is, I guess, a, just a, it's a different way of solving the same problem. But I suppose one of the things here is that because in a lot of other areas, we've got like that minimum experience is what people can get in other sectors. You can book a cinema ticket without supplying a date of birth, right? You don't, you don't say, I'm, I'm 15, look, here's my date of birth. You just, you just buy the movie ticket and you assume that when you get there, if you look underage, someone's going to say something to you. The same on a flight. You can book a flight ticket without supplying um, date of birth if, well, do you see what I mean? So it, it depends on your passport number, maybe, but it depends on what, what the minimum is for what you're trying to do. And I guess the question is, in leisure, is date of birth something that they need to participate? Is that really a thing that we're asking, or is it, is it going to create a barrier in the user experience? So should this... Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, Ben. Can I ask you to? <laughs> <laughs> I guess swimming's probably one of those things where you know I'm trying to buy two tickets, one for an adult, one for my child, mm -hmm. and and if I'm if they're under eight, they have to be supervised. It's a very specific date when they don't have to be supervised. So that is a a thing that one day I'll be absolutely fine to come swimming on my own. The next day I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, again, you can just put it as general wording, I guess, but. But generally, I think that's what, that's what we've always done traditionally, is we're going to have to have that face-to-face. -face. And I guess what we don't want is a whole load of pain operationally that we have to deal with on the back of it being really nice and simple on the front end. But when, when they come in, we've got to do lots of checks and balances. I, mean, um, I might ask, uh, but just before, before we answer the next question, sorry to put you on the spot, Dean. How does Fusion deal with this? Because I know you're cap not capturing date of birth. Why? Sorry, Dean, can you speak to the mic? Hi, yeah, we don't capture J to birth. Um, we rely on the centers or 
receptionists to make sure that they're conf uh, conforming to uh, reg regulations. So, two to one ratio. If you've got one adult, two kids, you're fine. Anything above that, uh, we don't allow. We try not allow, you know, uh, above that ratio. So, um, yeah, we we won't don't necessarily we don't uh, take data birth as, as part of the booking. Sorry, does anyone? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's good. Um, right, I'm going to go with you first. And then we'll yeah. come back to Venom. Just so. one sentence. Um, for triathlon events, we have minimum and maximum distances for different age groups. So it's a key safety thing in terms of how far a kid can go on a road, on a bike, right. uh, how much distance they can do in a pool, in a lake, all those sorts of things. For, so for us, I guess data first is pretty crucial. Okay. So it's a safeguarding issue, it seems, more than anything else. For that, yes, and I can hear that. And a question for Sport England. Wouldn't they want this data? <laughs> if, we're, if, we're, if we're not having date of birth and gender, or however we're going to describe that, then the, the data we're going to get is, yes, we have more people active, but we don't know who they are. Well, I, I guess we don't know exactly how old they are. Yes. I'm conscious of time. Um, this is a good, it's a good question to bring up. It sounds like there's a bit of a discussion to be had yet on this subject. Um, and there's, there's, I can see the differing points of view in, in the room on, on this. Um, uh, yeah. So, I, so should, we, should, we, should we come back to this? Perhaps we come back to this on the next W3C call. Do you want to say something? Natalie wants to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was just going to say that even if you collect the date of birth, from a point of view of safety, you're still going to have to do the check when somebody turns up anyway, because you're not going to take what somebody's typed in. So um, there may be an, uh, an approach whereby, for example, because we can already say age suitability in, in description, that there's something that where the broker puts in a check to say, are you sure you're within this date range? You don't actually need to collect the date of birth there, because as long as you're doing the prompt of booking, and there's the fallback in the centre. You probably don't need to pass that information around. From a data protection point of view, as soon as you get into date and gender, you'll be in very sensitive information territory, and that's extra requirements on everybody. So you have to be careful about that. Who is it? Paid for bookings. Are they not using a credit card? Yes. Or a payment method? Credit card. Any eight-year-old in this country that's got credit card. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, so if your descriptions are as they should be, and it's pulling through, yes. I'll just say it's then if a lot of those checks are going to be done, and you can obviously capture data later on down the line, but don't know you, you want to do it with Scott Black details. But the answer's in that description. If the data feed comes out and says there's an age description for its children only, that then should be dealt with by the booking engine. It shouldn't be a case that they just get thrown the same experience to register or guest register regardless. Well, so it's a good question. Qu work out what's restricted and offer a different pathway that collects the appropriate data. It's not if we need, so so okay. So we need to get the make sure the microphone's tra yeah. traveling because I'm just being uh, getting Sorry. right. What, what so should we get one more point from Steve on this, and then should yeah, we should a point we from Steve, move on? and then maybe a point a quick reply from a data user like an aggregator in the room. That would be good. And then we'll move on to a couple more questions here before we wrap up, if that's okay. Yeah, sounds good. I think um, we need to be careful whether we're coming at this from a customer point of view or the operator's point of view. Because the operators, for Sport England, for Data Hub, for all sorts of things, we want every piece of data we can possibly get. But we don't necessarily have to collect that at the first point of interaction. We want that to be as smooth as possible if we're looking at it from the customer point of view. And, and the fact is I can get on a tube train in 16 minutes and buy a junior ticket and pay a junior price, but it's up to the staff there to challenge me and have systems in place to say that I'm not a junior. Obviously, they'd ask me for ID. But, um, <laughs> but you know, I think that under eights and dates of birth can be manipulated online. People can claim that they misread that or didn't understand the question. And I think we need to be careful not to be too reliant on a system to weave out all of the safety and security concerns. There is still that human interaction that we need to consider and have in place. Thanks, Steve. Um, do any data users, aggregators in the room want to add a final comment on that? I will take that as a no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jamie, Jamie. Um, I'd just say that uh, we would generally implement what is contractually asked of us. 
Uh, and if that includes date of birth that we send to the operator, then we would just do that. We've got no problem about that. Great. Thanks, Jamie. Um, so i probably got time for a couple more questions, maybe three at a push, depending on how quickly we get through this. Let's do it. Let's do it. Then we can wrap up. So are there any plans to include attendance data in the Open Active Universe? For example, customer attended versus customer was a no-show. Uh, customer. Oh, so afterwards, uh, yes, so we've had this question before. Um, and the answer is at the moment there isn't a, a way to feed that back to the broker. So maybe in the future, but right now that, that two-way interaction doesn't exist. So you don't get that information back whether they turned up or not. Great. Uh, so one other question. Um, when are the booking systems going to implement open booking functionality for their customers? Are there dates? <laughs> That's a loaded I, question. I, I, <laughs> should, is that a fair question? <laughs> Maybe it's a question for any booking systems in the room rather than people. Yeah. There's another Pretty fair question there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to answer. Okay. <laughs> it's not, not our place to ask. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. So, um, firstly, this is a topic and a question that was asked of us at the most recent uh, Open Active Steering Group meeting. And uh, the first point was that this specification had to be signed off before that final piece of work could be delivered. And this is the process that we're in. So we hope, and the original schedule was by the end of this month, it would be signed off and therefore the work could be delivered. I think we spoke in loose terms of it taking approximately two months to then deliver it. Uh, and for Legend customers, that would be one release, and then all customers would have access to it immediately. Hmm. Great, Sean. That's fantastic. So one, one final question, which kind of is quite a specific question, but we can answer it in slightly more general terms because that might also help. Um, are Open Active drafting some example contracts uh, for between an operator and a broker? Um, brokers may have a hard time dealing with hundreds of unique commercial contracts. Um, so the short answer to this is no. <laughs> um, the slightly, more, slightly longer answer is um, we don't really want to get in the business of providing kind of templated contracts because of the sort of legal liability that comes with that. Um, two things that we could do here. First, we could provide a bit of a checklist of things that you want to consider when, when, when putting that kind of contract together, but we'd probably rely on working with some of you guys that are going through this process because you're the ones ultimately that are answer, asking yourselves those questions. Um, the second thing that could happen is that where, where you've got one of those contracts in place, it would be really exciting if an operator and a broker that have one of those contracts could publish it openly as an example um, <laughs> for others to reuse. <laughs> uh, Sounds like that's not going to happen. Um, so th th those are two, two, two possible routes on, on that particular question. I think more broadly, um, in terms of what kind of guidance we provide um, to help you kind of move this forward. I think that's, once we've got this wrapped up, that's going to be a focus for, for the team is to, is to think about the kind of questions that you've been coming up with today, put together as much guidance to help you crack on and, and make, this, make this happen. So watch your space. Um, I wonder before we move on, I might just, I could just give a one sentence answer to it or one word answer to each of the ones on you got you got one minute. Right. I'm going to try rapid fire this because I feel like there's some quite... Of, so, um, see how many we can get through in one minute. Um, does a lightweight data collection point uh, mean that we get limited demographic data? We've just talked about that. I think that's, that's a good issue. We need to figure out how, what we're going to do about that. We'll get back to you. Um, is there an overlap of CRM data? Yes, it could be confusing, Joe, if there are uh, two places where that information is stored. But we'd expect that the booking system would ultimately have that information. So, in terms of the email address. They might not have other information, but that would mean that they could keep that, um, that minimum that they need. So there's also... That's not going to help my one yeah, minute. <laughs> we'll, we'll cover that. We'll cover that. Um, pro um, uh, pricing, member pricing is not in scope. Member pricing is uh, 50 pounds a month. That's member pricing. Uh, pricing is 2 pound 50 for booking a single session. That's the difference. Any income from open bookings uh, would hit the holding account of local authority. That income would need to be allotted. So the cost center is a great, that's a great point. Um, I will follow up with you on that because we need to make sure there's... We literally had this conversation last week and no one can tell us what the minimum reconciliation information is. So, Sarah Quinn, I'll follow up on, with you on that. Uh, if dynamic, 
payment field of, I will follow you up. That's a very technical question, Chris. I'll follow up with you on that one. Uh, are brokers obliged to give a refund uh, or Crested, brokers are obliged to give a full refund, yes, not a credit note or booking in future. Um, that's currently how the spec is, is set. But, but like you say, how that refund is given to them is, is up to them. That's, that was your minute. Oh, <laughs> we didn't do too badly. There's, the rest are only upvoted by one. So, uh, the top one. The top one. Oh, Wait. sorry, Sean. Uh, which broker sales model uh, works best for the operator? Uh, yes, yeah, so the resellers we're aware of that do that, like I said, pay as you gym do it. Um, we're not aware of many that do that. Uh, definitely agree that it's more often the agent side, but um, obviously, like we said about the tour bus booking example, no harm in supporting both. Is that my one minute? Right, okay. Thank you for all the questions, guys. Um, yeah. We have the information, so what we'll do is we'll, we'll go through those. We might seek clarification from you individually. Thank you for putting your names against them. Um, like I said, we've got your details when you signed up to the event, um, and you did tick a box in there to say that we could <laughs> call you afterwards and ask you these questions, so thank you for that. Um, I don't know your date of birth, though, so sorry I can't necessarily help you. <laughs> um, so, shall we um, wrap this up? Are you good to... Um, so I've got a couple. We've got a couple of questions for you as we finish this uh, off. As we come into land, uh, yeah. Um, so uh, we talked about what's next. Um, well, what's next for you? I guess is is there's a there's a question about let's get some of the details sorted, and I think we're kind of. It, it sounds like there's maybe one contentious issue left here where we're trying to get through that, and that we'll, we'll figure out how we do that, um, and. Um, the, yeah, and, and then the, the, the other thing I wanted to ask, uh, we wanted to ask, which was really how many people here are up for this? I mean, I know that's a bit of a daft question, having gone through it all day, um, but, but there's, a, there's an extent to which some of this is crazy and like there's, there's, some, there's some new stuff in here. Some of it is really like no-brainer, this is a really obvious win. Um, to give you an example of a, a no-brainer thing, Change for Life is going to make... Uh, it wants to put booking into their website, into their experience. They are not charging commission. So it's commission free. 98% of primary schools, as you learned earlier, have this embedded in there, in what they're doing. And so as an operator, or as anybody with activities, that is a commission free, Public Health England are sponsoring an opportunity to get your stuff in front of more kids. Um, whether you get their date of birth or not, um, we'll find out. But but that, that, as an opportunity, let's say that you do, for the purposes of this com conversation, let's say that you, if, you, if that's what you need, let's say that you do, so we don't get that in the way. Um, if that was a thing that you, you could get involved in, like right now, I guess we're really interested in would you? So would you, turn off the, don't show everyone. <laughs> Some very excited people. No, as in turn off the answers. It, it did All right. Um, <laughs> So would you, without being biased towards what you just saw, uh, would you, uh, so the options are, you would want to get involved in all booking partnerships. So you're keen just to up for anything, to want to experiment, keen to get involved. Um, you're only interested in Change for Life because it represents low risk and zero commission. At this stage, you might do something later, um, but right now you want something simple and that opportunity seems like it's worth doing because it's like obviously win, win, win. Um, uh, maybe you need some more information first. Like I said, don't involve date of birth in this. Let's assume we've solved that problem. Um, because I can see that might be a blocker for some people. Um, let's assume we've solved that problem. Um, would you need other information other than that information um, to, uh, to move forward? In which case, maybe you need some more information first, and we'd love to, to find out what that is and what, what that looks like. And then finally, you're just going to wait and see what happens and let everyone else figure it out, and then at some point you might join in. Uh, so, yeah, if you could please just quickly vote. Um, I can see there's 35 people already voting while I've been blab talking. Uh, 30 seconds late, the, uh, the live stream is. So um, hopefully you've also voted because I've been talking for at least that long. If we get that number to 50, that would be great. Nearly there. <laughs> Anyone else? 42, come on. <laughs> Nearly? <laughs> no, everyone can vote. Okay. Let's, uh, let's see what the answer was. Ha! <laughs> Excellent. That's really good. <laughs> so generally, we're, we're up for it. Um, and there's some people that aren't sure. Um, be interested to find out what that's about. Um, OK, great. Thank you. Um, next question is, um, 
So there's a lot of people in the room who would love to talk to you about different things, right? Each one of you. There's probably a bunch of people in the room that would love to connect to you. Unfortunately, when you filled out the form at the beginning of this experience, you didn't tick a box to say we could share your details with each other. We've had a number of people ask if that's the case. Through the power of technology, um, if you answer yes to this, we actually know who you are. And so we'll take that as a, a allow to share the information. So if you could quickly just um, answer yes if you want to share your details. Answer no if you, you, you'd rather not. That's fine. We're not actually going to expose the answer to this just because... Yeah, we don't need to know. Your, your, your GDPR stuff is your... <laughs> um, do, you want to, do you want to do it? Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. What's the answer? Go on, what's the answer? Hey, great. Oh, we're a lovely community of sharing people. Isn't that brilliant? <laughs> Find them. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> that's exactly it. That's the personal data. Great, um, thank you. So um, uh, I think that's. Is it, are you? Uh, no, you, well, if you take it down, they can still vote. Oh, sorry, you can't. Sorry, keep it up. I'll take it down. That's better. Uh, so, so those on the on the, the screen uh, who are watching us on live stream, uh, you can carry on voting. Anyone who wants to carry on voting, that will stay up uh, till the end, which is in two minutes. Um, so that just gives me enough time to say. Um, great, you're willing to work with each other. We put that slide up before we knew that you'd said yes. <laughs> I hadn't got an alternative prepared. Um, so um, thank you so much for your time today. Um, we've come in on time by some absolute miracle and, um, and really appreciate your thoughts. We've got all your information. You've put your, your, your thoughts in. We're going to go through that and analyze your, the results. Who said what? We might get back in touch with you, those specific issues. We'll figure out the date of birth point, guys. Somehow we'll get there. And um, uh, thank you so much. This has been brilliant. And I look forward to seeing you again soon.